Hello everybody. Hopefully you should be able to see um, my palette now with a couple of colors laid out on the palette. Um, you should also hopefully be able to hear me okay. So um, please do pop. Hello Olaf, good to see you. And hello everybody. Uh, please do pop a quick note in the chat box if you can just to let me know if you can hear me okay and if you can see my palette <clears throat> with a few paints and the egg because we're going to do a quick study of this egg. So basically I just want to show you a couple of things today about finding, thank you Ginia, about finding light and shadow once you have the local colour and obviously I'm going to be talking a little bit about Munsell, okay? I don't know how long we're going to be going for, maybe half an hour to an hour, um, something like that. Um, thank you, Marcos. Thanks, Wilma. Thanks, Olaf. 100% good. Brilliant. Thank you. Always good to know <laughs> because, of course, I can't really see myself. Um, sorry, just drinking tea, slurping tea. So I'm going to do a quick study of this egg. So I've, I took a photo of it earlier on. Um, I had it on, on the still life stand and here is the photo. Um, one of the difficulties with the streaming software that I use is getting really good color reproduction on the photos when I import them in. So the photo was actually really close um, and I've kind of col color corrected it in the software to get it as close as I can to this actual egg, but it's still very slightly different. Okay. So. Munsalicious color. So, uh, Suzanne, was it you who came, first came up with the, the, the word munsalicious? Or was it? I can't remember who came up with it first, but it was basically someone in one of the group, the Facebook groups that I run when I do painting workshops, online painting workshops. And someone came up with the term munsalicious, which is just too good not to use. <laughs> and um, actually, we're, we're evolving a bit of a vocabulary. But anyway, I digress. Let me tell you what I've got on my palette. Titanium white, yellow ochre, transparent red oxide, raw umber, burnt umber, and black. Now what I have mixed up already here are just some really basic colors I threw together really quickly so that I could begin painting the background of the study. So here is what I've done on it so far. So I just wanted to knock something together quickly. Obviously the colors I have in my background aren't accurate to, you reckon it was Susan? I, <laughs> you came up with Pumberites, yes. I think it probably was Susan Monsalicious, yeah. Um, so um, the hues of these colors are obviously not exactly the same as the photo, but what is pretty much the same is the value and the chroma, the most important parts of painting. Okay, here's the palette so we can see it all at once. Okay, so I'm going to do a little bit of monsaliciousness today. So the first thing I'm going to do, okay, is as I did yesterday. Um, on the live session, I'm going to match the local color of this egg because that's where we start, right? Hello, Jan. Good to see you. How's the weather in Texas? Here it is gray. It's a very typical and drizzly. It's a very typical English day today. Seems like our summer is already over. I'm going to put the uh, I'm going to put the palette back on full screen while I do this, so you can see me doing it. Okay, so. I found yesterday that the quickest way to get the closest to the local color of this egg was to start off with transparent red oxide and then add white to bring it up to the right value. Now, obviously the egg is quite light in terms of value. Um, value we were talking about on the first day of this week's color challenge. No, the second day actually, Hugh was the first day, wasn't it? So I'm mixing like a fair bit of color here. When you um, approach painting this way, it's very direct approach. You pre-mix the colors that you need before you start. It's a good idea to make sure you have enough mixed because 
If you don't, it's not the end of the world, but it does interrupt the creative flow a little bit if you have to be stopping to mix. One of the, the beauties about pre-mixing is that you nail the colors first and then you can just concentrate on the expression, you know, the art of painting rather than the more technical bits of getting accurate color. So let's have a look at our egg. Sunny and hot. Wow, egg just totally rolled into my transparent red oxide. You look up for a second and this is what happens, you see. Hang on, let me clean my egg a little bit. It's live TV, you see. Like they always say, well, that's thrown out the local colour a bit, hadn't it? And it also goes to show, uh, uh, yeah, actually, uh, I did that deliberately to show you how strong a chroma transparent red oxide is. So today we'll be looking at this side of the egg, <laughs> which has the little stamp on it and some other paint that I got on it earlier on. <laughs> I can see it's going to be one of those sessions already today. Let's have a look where we are, okay? So is this anywhere near the egg? Yes, it's really, really near, but it's too red. You can't paint with that, it's too red. We wanna go a little bit more yellow. So this is what I was doing yesterday, basically. I'll get yellow ochre and I'll mix that up to the same value with white. Has to be the same value, remember? Because I, all I want to do with this colour here is I want to take it on a little journey. I want to make it more yellow. I don't want to change the value or the chroma. That's about the right value. So I'll get some of that. Mix a little bit of this in there. And I'll be getting much closer to the actual colour of the egg. Okay, everything is pretty good at the moment, but um, it's maybe a little bit light. I'm going to bring it down a little bit. Tiny bit of each of these because I've let the value go a little bit high. Now what this will do, because I'm going to have a greater amount of what you could think of, I suppose, is my staining paints, the transparent red oxide and the yellow ochre, what's supplying the color, the chroma might go a little bit too high. Mm. No, I think, what do you think? I think that's pretty good. I think it's maybe a little bit too red still, so I'm gonna bring in a little bit more yellow ochre. I'm trying to get like, you know, really close. I'm just, I'm doing obviously fairly quickly, but I'm trying to get close. Like. So <clears throat> what you can do if you really want to check stuff like this carefully is isolate the color and then hold your sample over it. And I would say, actually, that's pretty good. That looks pretty good to me. Although looking at my photo of my egg, I think the chroma is a little bit low. Let's have a look at the color filter I put on the photo. Because I have a feeling I might have dropped the chroma a bit too much on the photo. I'm trying to get the photo kind of close to the actual egg. But as I was saying, it's slightly tricky because um, I have fairly basic color correction facilities in my streaming software. But there we go. I think that's pretty close, right? I think probably you would agree that's, um, that's pretty close to the local color. So a lot of people have asked me actually, what is a local color? And the local color is best thought of as the color that something is independent of light or shadow. Lida says it looks good. Hello, Romy, good to see you. Hi, Margie. Yeah, we're doing egg art, uh, 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 un unplanned egg art today. Um, <clears throat> but I'd say that's a pretty that's a pretty good match. It's interesting to find out actually what value this is. So this is a Munsell value scale. Let me knock off the reference photo just for a second so I can show you this. You can see the whole palette now. So what value do you think this is? You know, we were guessing value on day two. I would say um, it's probably about mm, a value seven. 
So this is the value seven on my chart. So I could pop it on there and see. And if I put it on a couple of other ones either side, it looks like it's obviously darker than this one, right? It's obviously lighter than that one. It's probably about a seven, looks about right to me. About a value seven. So I'm not going too far into the Munsell chips at the moment. But if I wanted to show you the chip that was closest to this, it would be <clears throat> this one. No, that's too light. It would be that one, which is really, really close, right? But I think the chroma is very slightly too high. So just to show you where this comes from in the Munsell book, the big book I'm talking about in the one with lots and lots of chips. Um, <clears throat> this comes from the 5YR page. I'll get it out and show you. A few of the chips are missing from this page because I've already got them out and done other stuffs with them. I'm in the middle of another painting. But this chip comes from here. So the value is seven. So, you know, that bore out what we found on our value scale here, that the value is seven. So that's good to know. And we know that the chroma, well, this is chroma six. I mean, it doesn't really matter. It's just like this is low, this is high. It's somewhere below middle is enough, you know. That's enough for you to be painting. Um, <clears throat> cool. So an interesting thing that I found after painting a lot of not eggs, but spheres and stuff like that and cubes is that one, what tends to happen is that as a color, this is the local color, right? So as a color goes up into the light, it tends to keep the chroma at first and then the chroma drops off as you go very light, which handily is what happens with paint as well. And as it goes down into the shadow, the value comes down and the chroma drops a little bit. Okay, so that gives us a kind of a clue. So actually I'll show you that again because that chip came from there. So the next one up is there. So that would be a useful color to have, you know. That one would go there, this one would go there. That's going to be like our shadow color right down here. This will be like our half tone color. Here's our local and there's our light. Let's just get those out actually, because you will usually find that you will get that, I call it the chroma curve, as it goes from the light into the half tone into the shadow, up to the light light. But these colors are all a little bit too high chroma, except for maybe that one. Because if I look at this chip, it's a little bit higher chroma than the egg. Very slightly higher chroma. Because I think my egg's getting a bit dirty, actually. I've been messing about with it too much today. So I wouldn't want it to be quite that high chroma, you know. Egg and chips. <laughs> David, don't. Egg and chips. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, I feel in the interests of health and safety, I should advise that eating Munsell chips is not a good plan. I haven't tried it, um, but I don't think it would be too pleasant. Okay. So let's say I want to mix something that's about there, like this one, a little bit lighter. But I want to drop the chroma a little bit from what it is there. Oh, someone asked a question about chroma earlier on, which I believe I missed. Sometimes I do, when I'm, I'm chatting and we're joking about, I, I miss the odd question, which I'm sorry about, but let me have a quick check. Um, Wendy, it was you who came up with Monsalicious. <laughs> I'm just looking for... I'm just going through the chat quickly because... Ah, uh, Ellen asked, when is it appropriate to lower chroma with a neutral scale? Well, some controversy about this. My good friend Richard Murdoch does use neutrals when he paints. I never use them anymore. If I want to drop the chroma of something, I drop it with a lower chroma version of the same color. So I never use neutrals for that. Okay. The reason I don't is because I find that neutrals, although in theory they should work in practice, they change the hue. A little bit too much. Hello, Sue. Good to see you. Wendy is responsible for Munsalicious. We must all remember. So I could try 
to just add white to this to get that. But what will happen if I do is the white will drop the chroma and then I'll end up losing chroma in my light and more light equals, generally speaking, equal or more chroma. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to, it will drop a little bit anyway, but I'm going to um, start off with transparent red oxide again. Let's see what happens. Bring it up to this value this time. It's going to lose a little bit of chroma inevitably, right? Because I'm going to have to add white. This is, I just want to demonstrate to you like right from the beginning as if I was mixing that color. Not quite light enough yet. That's about the right value. It's, it's next value up if you like. Okay. Mm, did lose a bit of chroma though, didn't it? So if I compare that against the chip, it's, mm, it's a lot lower in chroma. It really is. I don't want to lose that much chroma. You know, that would be a little bit frustrating. Um, and it's also too red still. So I need still need to bring that, do that thing where I pull it more yellow. Now there's an idea. What's going to let me pull it yellow and bring the chroma up? Yellow ochre won't do it because if I bring yellow ochre up with white, that's going to lose its chroma as well. What do you think might do it? Dun, dun, dun. Let's try cad yellow. It's going to swing it more yellow for sure. And it does want to go a little bit more yellow. And it's also going to raise the chroma a little bit. Let's try it. I'll just put, get a little bit of this. Not too much, because I don't know what's going to happen here. You know, one of the things I would encourage you to do is to ha have a bit of a play and have a bit of fun with your mixes and just try stuff. You know, just try stuff and see what happens. It's only paint. I know it's not cheap, but you know. Sometimes you have to lose a little bit just to get where you want to be. Still don't have anything like the chroma and it's too dark as well. So it's obviously way too dark. So I'm going to bring in some more white. Bring up the value a little bit more. I'm losing quite a lot of chroma now. The more white I add to bring it up to the right value the more chroma I lose. And I want to hold this chroma up into the light. So that's about the right value, but the chroma has dropped right off, really has dropped off. I wanted more chroma than that. What can I do? I'm going to have to bring something else in that's higher chroma. A red. Now any red would do. I'm fond of this one, Quinacridone Rose, just because it's useful for a broad range of things. Okay, but isn't that interesting how quick the chroma dropped off? So let's say, let's say I'm going to start with quinacridone rose this time. And I'm going to use the white to bring it up to the same value. You're like, Paul, what are you doing? And that's just not, it's, it's not even, it's just not right. It's not the right color. No, it's not. But it, it does have more chroma. Let's check the value. The value is good. And the chroma is good. So, you know, if I put a little dab on the chip, there, I don't know if you can see that, but it's the right value for the color that I want. And the chroma is good as well. The chroma is pretty good. So I could put yellow in it, the cad yellow again, but I think that's probably going to bring the chroma up a little bit too much. So let's try this time. I don't want to bring the chroma up any further than where it is. Not really. Let's try yellow ochre and white. Because yellow ochre isn't going as far up the value scale from when it started as the transparent red oxide is, so it should keep a little bit more of its chroma. I'm out of white already. Let's put some more white out. Diana says, using monster will save you money in the long run. Well, I do believe that's true. Leader says, is transparent red oxide the only pigment you can use as a basic starting color for the egg? Well, the answer to that is obviously no, because I'm off. I mean, you could use almost anything um, on the orange and red side of things, yellow, orange and red side of things. And eventually you could pull it back. You know, obviously I'm using a red now. I'm using a, a purple red, even quinacridone rose. 
But you want to try and start with something that's at least close to where you want eventually to be, you know. Let's have a look. Well, the value is good for that, but it's a little bit light actually, but the chroma, I'll get the value right. The chroma is way lower than where I want to be. I don't want to lose chroma in my light. And that's way lower. So I'm going to add a little bit of yellow to it to bring the chroma back up. So I'm just playing back, trying to make sure that I get the chroma that I need. So I'm adding yellows. So but what I'm after here is like a, a yellow of the right chroma and the right value. I don't really care how I get there as long as it's got those things in common. So that's probably about right. I think maybe it's a little bit too low value. I'll bring in a little bit of white. So what happens if I say, if I take this yellow, some of that, and I put a little bit of this red in it? Hmm. Well, that's looking promising. Better. It's just a tiny bit lower chroma than the chip, and that is pretty much what I want. Because the local is a tiny bit lower chroma than the chip. So I had to use different pigments that time. I couldn't use, I did use a bit of yellow ochre, but I couldn't use my transparent red oxide because by the time I got it up near the top of the value range, I'd lost too much chroma. You know, hopefully you can see like this, these here have much lower chroma than this one. I'm going to mix a little bit more of that because I don't think I'm going to have enough. I mean, this is like um, kind of extreme mixing, if you like. I'm really thinking carefully about the colors and trying to get them really, you know, close to what I'm going to be seeing when I look at the at the subject. Getting it up to the value first, remember, we've got to get it to the right value, otherwise we'll be in all kinds of trouble. And then I want to add some more chroma, yellow will do it. This cad yellow, by the way, is a value eight, and this color that I'm mixing is a value eight, so that'll do it well. So now I've got a higher chroma, yellow. A bit of the red and a bit of the yellow will give me the orange that I want. And that's this is why it's really, really useful to be able to understand the hue of the color that you're trying to get. You know, I mean, you could stab around and you could get pretty close for sure. I think maybe even a little bit more chroma. If I wanted a little bit more, I could do that too. Add a bit more of the red and then add a little bit more of the cad yellow and that will give me higher chroma. So what I'm trying to show you here is not recipes. A lot of people look for recipes for things. I'm trying to show you ways that you can affect the color. I mean, this basically is normal color mixing, except that we're thinking about it in terms of hue and value and chroma, rather than any other way of thinking about it. So it just helps you to get closer to the colors that you want. So that'll do pretty well for my light color, you know. Mariana, I'm using um, titanium white today, just because it's quicker and it's opaque. Yeah, I mean, there's any number of, of, of tube paints you could be using to get these colors. I mean, you know, all everything I've got here are just variations of reds and yellows. Um, obviously, there's no blue there because I'm not going to be using a blue to drop the chroma, you know. Do 
Ginia says, what about Michael Harding Bright Yellow Lake for the yellow? Yes, you could use that. The reason I wouldn't use the Bright Yellow Lake is because it's a green yellow and I'm in orange land. So if the yellow is already more towards orange, then that's going to be more useful to me. You know? Kathy says, I think I understand using the browns, for instance, for lowering chroma of warm colours. But how do you lower the chroma of blues and greens? Assume the browns would not work, so use black or greys if you don't already have a lower chroma version of the colour you're working with. You nailed it, Kathy, already. Ivory black, which I have on the palette here, is a blue. It's a low chroma blue. So if you want to lower the chroma of a blue, your best choice is ivory black. Mix it to the same value as the colour you want to um, drop the chroma with, of, sorry, with white, and you're good to go. Um, if it's a green, you want something that's somewhere between a black and a yellow, right? Well, the nearest thing we have to yellow down there that's really low chroma, really, is um, raw umber. But depending on the value, you could also use black and yellow ochre, which have a little bit more chroma, but it will be more green. You know, so if I add a bit of white to that, it's like a very low chroma green, you know. So all I'm doing, you know, it's not, it's not any kind of, it is kind of magic, but it's not. I mean, that's just a blue and a yellow. Yellow ochre and ivory black. Blue and yellow make green. So I'm just trying to find a low chroma blue and a low chroma yellow that I can use to make the colour that I want. Then you've got to get it to the right value. And depending on the value of the colour you're trying to drop the chroma of, that would work, you know. That would work. So it's really, really useful to know the hue of your tube paints. Palette's getting a bit out of hand already. All right, so let's say I want to mix. So I said I was going to mix four colours, right? I might cheat a little bit and I might mix five. But I've got two colours for my light at the moment, the light part of the egg. So I want a half-tone colour next. Now, I know what the value is. It's going to be about here, which is like a value four, which is good value for my half tone, for my egg. The hue is the same. It's like an orange, you know. It's about the same chroma. It would it would drop a little bit. There's this big myth that's been circulating for a long time, especially among illustrators. This thing called the bump, that the area of highest chroma is the half tone. Well, I'm here to tell you that that's not true. Okay, the area of highest chroma is the light. Because light means more colour, right? More light bouncing off the thing means more colour hitting your eye. You know, it's not, it's not, it's not rocket science. <laughs> In the half tone, there is less light, so the chroma drops a little bit. Karen says, perylene black is a green base. Cool, I'll have to check that out. Lida says, doesn't every realistic painter use value, hue and chroma? There is no way around it if you want your painting to work. Lida, you'd be surprised. By the way, am I pronouncing your name right? I was asking you the other day, and I can't remember if you answered me. Is it Lida or Lida? Um, you'd be surprised, not every, it's only recently that a lot of painters have started talking about hue, value and chroma, and hue, value and chroma is monsel. And what always makes me laugh is that a lot of people say, yeah, I can't, I can't be doing with monsel. I can't, all that monsel stuff, no, all that, all that chip matching and stuff, I can't be doing with it. You know, Munsell is basically hue, value and chroma, that's all it is. The chip matching thing is an extension of that approach to colour, that's all it is. Um, but a lot of people use vague terms like colour tone and stuff like this. And, and a lot of people only think in terms of value and hue really, and don't think about chroma as a separate thing. So Lida, you're actually ahead of most people if you're already thinking in terms of value, hue and chroma. But it is becoming accepted now, just because it's the best way to think about color, frankly. Let's mix this. I'm going to start off with an orange. That's, I'm going to pick, choose something which is, is, is pretty close already, right? So, so let's say I choose transparent red oxide. It's, it's a bit too red and it's a bit too dark, you know. So I want to bring the value up and I want it to go more yellow. 
I've got a couple of choices here. I've got really two yellows. I've got a cad yellow and a yellow ochre. So let's try it with both, right? Just to show you, you know, this is, you know, people are, are very keen on like making these charts and stuff about finding out, like the, the, the uh, Richard Schmidt book, Schmidt book. I think he's a brilliant painter and I'm not criticizing him, but I don't personally think those charts are very useful. But this kind of experimentation is. So I'm gonna raise the value. This is yellow ochre I'm using now. So I've got to about the right value, I would say there. It's a little bit too red still, but the chroma is just about where I want it, you know, and the value is good. If I used cad yellow, what do you think is gonna happen? It's gonna go more yellow, but also the chroma is gonna go much higher because I'm mixing two high chroma colors together. So this one should be higher chroma. You know, if you look at the at the, the tube paints, when you're choosing to mix them in terms of hue, value and chroma, then it's it's a bit easier to kind of to guess what's going to happen to the colors, you know. Peter says, I was matching egg colors and missed a bit. Can you please read out the Munsell notations of those four chips? Peter is a Munsellite. I've gone too light with that. It's the value has gone up too much. I'm going to bring it back down a little bit. Um, but this also is a little bit too red. I will in a second, Peter. This is a little bit too red. And the chroma is a little bit high. I'll bring that value back down. So no matter which of these I use, they're both too red. This one, the chroma is too high. This one is not bad, you know, yellow ochre and um, and transparent red oxide. So let's junk this high chroma one because I'm gonna have to mess with that and I don't really wanna have to mess with it. But I want to send this more yellow without raising the chroma, you know. Before I forget, Peter, I'll tell you what these chips are. I'll show you in the, on the big book page, actually, because I, I had it out earlier on. So the local one I've got here, this is 5YR7. The value is 7 and the chroma is 6. It's actually, the egg is actually slightly lower chroma. It's higher than 4, but it's lower than 6. You know, this is the thing about the chips. They're never going to be exactly bang on. Yes, I'm inclined to agree, Olga, yes. Um, this one is the next one up, so this is 5YR as well. The chroma is 6 and the value is 8. This one is value 4, also 5YR, also chroma 6. This one is 5YR and the value is 2 and the highest chroma you can get there in paint is a 4. Okay. Um, I need this to go more yellow, but I don't want to drop the chroma. Also don't have enough of it, so I'm going to mix it a little bit more. I like to paint fairly thickly because I paint directly, you know. So it's great, you know, it's the right value, it's the right chroma and you could say it's fine, you know, and you, you would get away with it. It's not too bad. It's just a little bit too red. Is that a problem? Well, it depends on how you approach painting. You could, if as long as your values are good, you can get away with a lot with paint. And if your chrome is a good, then you can get away with murder. But if I want to send this more yellow, what I would choose personally is I want to start with something that's more yellow, but it needs to be low value, right? Because I need to bring the value down. So I would start with raw umber Yes, it's low chroma, but it is already towards yellow, much more than transparent red oxide or burnt umber are, which are both red oranges. And then if I bring the value of that up with cad yellow, haven't got enough of it. It's going to be very, very yellow indeed, but it's it's the chroma isn't going to be too high because I'm mixing a low chroma color and a, light, a high chroma color, so I'm going to end up with like middle to low chroma. 
the more yellow, obviously, that I put in, the lighter it would get and the higher chroma it would get, you know. There you go, so that's a bit lighter and it's a bit higher chroma because the yellow is higher chroma. So you can think about, you know, too light. You can think about the tube paints that you've got there in terms of hue, value and chroma and you can guess. And nine times out of ten, you'll be right what's going to happen to your mix when you put that in. So you don't have to do so much kind of stabbing in the dark, you know. So let's say if I mix this with a little bit of this. Green, you're going to put green in there? Yes, because it's going to send it a little bit more towards yellow, which is all I want. So I've got one on one side. I want to be here. I've got one over here that's too orange. I've got one over here that's too yellow. Bring them together and they'll meet in the middle, which is where I want to be. Color magic. Gone a little bit too far. I'll bring a bit of the orange back in. Lovely. I'm going to stick that there because it's. I tend to organize my palette light to dark. It just helps me keep control of it. All right, so that's going to be like my half tone color. I could possibly drop the chroma a little bit of that, and I might do when we get to putting it on the paint. We'll see. So the shadow. Well, it's very low value. It's like a value two. So I've got. I could start off with burnt umber, which is a slightly lower value. It's going to be probably a little bit too red, slightly too red as it is at the moment. I'm not sure. So if I wanted to bring it up, I don't want to drop any chroma. So if I, I only want to bring it up a little bit. So if I put some yellow in it, let's see what would happen. Cad yellow and slowly bring up the value. probably going to go too yellow. Yeah, it's good. I mean, the value is good. The chroma is good, you know, um, but it's, it's a bit too yellow. Well, what about transparent red oxide? That is already about the right value. Okay. But it's too red. Oh, well, hang on a minute. This one is too yellow. So if transparent red oxide is too red, if I mix a bit of those both together, then the transparent red oxide is going to swing this towards red. And I should nail the color, right? It will also give me the maximum chroma that I can get at this hue. Which, if I'm lucky, should be very slightly higher than the chip. Which it is, so that should be good. So maybe a little bit dark. Bring the value up a little bit. So, I mean, I think probably the most, I need going to need more of that. The most useful lesson to learn from this is that you can't just get the local color and then add white or black or add white or brown in order to get the color that you want. I'm just mixing up a little bit more of this. You know, if you want to keep the right chroma and hue right the way through the range of the colors that you want to paint something, then each color needs to be mixed separately with different paints because each of these tube paints is basically a component and they all have different properties, different values mostly. Um, they achieve their highest chroma at different parts of the value range at different hues. So you need to be thinking about all of those things really. So that's given me like Four colors. I think personally I will need another one that's slightly darker than this one because there's too much gap between these two. So if I mix those together, I'm going to lose a lot of chroma. Diana says, does Munsell work for landscape painting? Well, um, I think it could, but I think it would probably work more conceptually than anything else because say you, uh, it's very different when you're working outside, I think, because you've got the light to, to deal with. So if you're painting into the light, you know, and you try and hold up, 
In fact, if you try and hold up a color mix on your palette or you try and hold up a Munsell chip, the same thing, it's going to be in shadow because the light is coming towards you. So it's going to be no use for judging at all. If the light is behind you, however, I think it would be useful. Yeah, or to the side. I think it probably would be useful in helping you get closer. But Munsell is just, it's not necessarily the chips. This is just one way to use it. Munsell is just hue, value and chroma. It's just thinking about colour in that way. So if I wanted a colour like in between these, so this is like a value uh, 7 and that's like a value 4, like a 5 would probably be useful. So I've just got this out of the same page. Value 5, you know, I could mix that one or this one either or something in between the two. It's not going to be the end of the world, you know, where, where this ends up. What's close to this colour if I want to mix it? Yellow ochre is almost exactly the right value. But it's too yellow. Well, what about if I bring transparent red oxide, which we know is a red orange? up to the right value with, mm, let's use white, because it doesn't need to go all that far, and transparent red oxide will keep its chroma up quite a long way up the value range. So if I have some of the yellow and I mix in some of the orange, this is probably going to be too, it's too high chroma. It's too colourful, it's too intense. If I was an illustrator and I believed in the bump, it would be perfect, but I'm not and I don't. I need to drop the chroma. What am I going to use? Well, the Pumberites here will, will be used to me saying raw umber and white. <laughs> but we're, we're, uh, raw umber is a slightly yellow orange. So actually, Burnt Umber, which I rarely use these days, but Burnt Umber would probably be better because it's slightly more of a reddish orange. So if I bring Burnt Umber up to the same value with white, value five, right? I've overshot a little bit there, put a bit more Burnt Umber in. Why Burnt Umber? Because it's an orange. It's a low chroma orange. So it's gonna help me drop the chroma of this color just a little bit. It's too dark now. And I always have to have them to the same value, always get them to the same value. That looks about right. Why does it work? Well, if you look at them, at the, this is just a map of color mixing. That's all it is. It's a map of, of how to mix color, you know. So I'm here, I wanna move this way. So if I have something that's more like that and I mix the two together, then I'll end up in the middle. You know, it's not, <laughs> it's really, it's, it's quite simple really when you, when you see it laid out. That's how I think of the Munsell book as a, a map. And once you have it kind of fixed in your head, you have a, like a mental representation of it. you can actually mix really quickly. Obviously, I'm going through and explaining all the steps here, so it takes a little bit longer. That should do quite nicely. It's a little bit lower value than I intended, but I think it will be fine. So I've actually mixed five colors. I totally lied. I said I was going to do four. Usually, I find when I'm painting stuffs, I mix two colors for the light which I generally refer to as the dark light and the light light, just because there's so much more happens in the light. A half tone and a shadow, four colors. But I've done an extra one here because there's a lot of gentle gradation on the egg. But does it work? This is what we want to know, isn't it really? Let's bring this back up and that. And I'll bring up the reference photo as well with the caveat that I think the color on the photo is not perfect. Just somewhere near. Obviously the background's different. I'm not bothered about that. So I've kind of divided this out into light and shadow. So I've got a bunch of colors here. So if I divide this out further, 
you know, now I'm thinking about where are these colors going to go. So this is my shadow side and this is my light side. Okay, so this is kind of like what people often call the terminator or the bed bug line. There. There's also a lot of reflected light underneath from light which is coming down, hitting the surface and then bouncing back up in underneath the egg. So all of this over here is reflected light. So that makes this what we call the darkest part, what we call the core shadow. Okay. Core shadow color. Half tone is going to be like, obviously these are, there are abstractions a little bit. It's that it's careful gradation, but it's going to be about like that, the half tone and the half tone ends up being almost the same value as the reflected light, which is bouncing down here and up there. And on my light side, I've got a dark light and a light light. So let's say the light is coming down this way. So let's say this is going to be the dark light and that's going to be the light light. These are a lot easier to see once you've got the background and the cast shadow already in, by the way. What shall I use to paint this with? Hogs, I think, today. Well, I think, you know what, I'm going to paint the, I'm going to paint the shadow side with a synthetic. And then I'm going to paint um, the light side with hogs, so I get more texture in the light. So what I usually do is like, this is linseed oil and terps mixed. And I've already, on the panel, I've already put a really, really thin layer of this. And I usually like to have a little bit on my brushes as well just so I, they work easily, you know. Shadow. So it's worth bearing in mind relationships, okay? So when this goes down, it should be darker than the background. Result, it is. So let's bring that round. It kind of melts off into nothing where it hits the cast shadow around here. But then from here, you're starting to get a little bit of reflected light. So let's just bung this in for now and then we can paint into it. I'm painting this nice and flat because it's the shadow area, you know. We'll just paint all of this in and then we'll deal with the reflected light in a second. Shelley says, can you repeat the Munsell designations? I can. This shadow is value two. The chroma is four and the hue is five YR. They're all five YR, except a little bit more towards red because I've actually gone with, tried to go a little bit more red as the, as the egg is and slightly lower chroma actually. But those are the, those are the, the, the starting points, if you like, those are the closest. So this is five YR. Four. Which for anyone who's not used to this stuff just means that it's orange, yellow, red. The value is two, which means it's dark and the chroma is four. Bung it in. <laughs> is that a new one? Have I never said bung it in before? Just bung it in. You, you've got the color. All you need to do is bung it in. Okay. Half tone. That's going to be kind of coming out of. Obviously, the half tone isn't all the same, just one band. It, it gradually comes out and then lightens as it goes. I'm going to paint the reflected light mostly with the half tone as well, although I may lighten that a little. We'll see how we go. It's hard really to see until you've got all of the colors in, how they're gonna work. Get another brush out, cause that's a little bit too dark. So as the half tone comes out towards the light, it gets slightly lighter. So I'll use this slightly lighter color that I mixed. I'm just, I'm not actually doing any modeling at the moment or blending or anything like that. I'm just putting the colors where they need to go, like as bands really, you know, just just because I want to show you like where they go. 
and the light. And as I say, I quite often I like to have, this is actually the local color. I like to have um, two lights, like a darker one and a lighter one, because there's a very gentle gradation happens in the light. It falls off, the value falls off very quickly when you get to the shadow. But in the, in the light, it's kind of, it's quite gentle. Blimey, egg is appearing. So we know this is the right color, right? Because I actually matched it to the egg. The light light. I think the light light's a little bit yellow, actually. I think the hue's gone a little bit yellow. This is the lightest part. I'm going to reel off these, if anyone who is already a, a Pumberite, I'm going to reel off these um, these numbers for you again. Yeah, this is a little bit too yellow, but this is kind of, in a way, it's not a bad thing because it illustrates something that I, I find myself often saying, is that um, <clears throat> the most important things, as long as you're close in hue, the most important things are um, the value and the chroma. I'm actually going to fill that in. There's a, there's a kind of a little highlight area <clears throat> around here. Um, I'm at maximum kind of chroma at this value here anyway. But it does go a little bit lighter. So if I just grab some titanium white and mix a slightly lighter version there. And pop that in. If this was very glossy, um, the highlight would stand out more. If it was a glossy surface, eggs are kind of like satin, aren't they? You know, it would stand out a lot more. So I think looking at the half tone and the reflected light, I think is a little bit too dark. So I can bring that up with this color here. You know, if I'm squinting down, I want it to be like looking about right. I'm going to start blending the colors a little bit. So we're keeping fairly consistent hue. Chrome is fairly consistent. It drops, obviously, as we go into the... Um, into the shadow. I think I brought my half tone out too far and it needs to go back a little bit. So when you're kind of modeling form, one of the things to bear in mind, and um, you're very welcome, Anne. <laughs> no problem, you need to go. This, by the way, this is being recorded, so you'll be able to see it later. What happens with the values on a curved surface like this is they go, they move very slow. It's very gradual, very slow gradation from light to shadow, and then bam, it falls off a cliff quite quickly. But you still want to make sure that you're it's sudden, like the value suddenly drops quite quickly when you get to the shadow. But you still want to make sure that your um, your terminator, your bed bug line, is is reasonably soft. <clears throat> so at this point, like there's enough on there to, for me to know that it's going to work. It's really just about making sure that the right colors are in the right place. So if I squint down, now I've taken too much half tone out. If I squint down, I want to be seeing a feeling of the form. So 
So you're kind of gradually like bringing the planes down and mixing one into the other until they begin to curve more gently. Um, and what I tend to do a lot when I'm about this stage, because there's quite a lot of paint on there, <clears throat> is to blend it a bit. Yeah, Dorian Iton is a, is an absolute demon on this stuff about how how values change and stuff like that across the surface. So this is a really soft, just a dry brush, soft synthetic. It's actually a Windsor and Newton scepter gold, but it's really useful for blending stuffs. Dorian is really, really well worth checking out. He's a lovely man and he knows a lot about how value changes across a form and he's extremely good at, uh, I think anyway, he's extremely good at explaining it as well. So hopefully you can see by now that the form is starting to appear. And once you get it to this stage, it's really just a case of trying to fine tune it. Until you get it. The right values in the right place and, and a gradual gradation over towards the bed bug line, at which point it falls off quite quickly. But you'll also um, hopefully see what we've got going on in the color. So we've we've kept the we've kept the hue pretty constant across the surface. We've kept the chroma fairly constant, except of course that it drops off in the shadow. Okay. So that's basically what I wanted to show you today. How you can by thinking about chroma and hue and value separately, you can organize the color so that it works for you rather than against you. And actually, you don't, it's not all that complicated. You don't have to do a lot of complicated stuff to make color work. A lot of it is just down to thinking about the hues, the values, and the chromas. And making sure that you mix them carefully. And then when you put them down, they will tend to describe the form for you, pretty much. Bring a bit more um, slightly lower value into my shadow around there, around the bottom. And the edges, obviously, are really important in showing form too. But hopefully that's shown you how by thinking about hue, value and chroma, you can almost you can kind of figure out um, what colors you need to mix. And then if you if you know what um, what the hues, values and chromas of your um, tube paints are, You can get, you can do, put the mixes together much more quickly and easily than you could any other way. Suzanne says the half tone feels too warm. I think it does as well. I think it's got a little bit too thin with the blending. But this is actually a good opportunity for me to show you something else. So, say I wanna, I do want to bring down the half tone, which looks a little bit too, she says it's too warm. Now, 
this is a point that I find myself making a lot. You know, people talk about warm and cool a lot. And one of the really interesting things about warm and cool is that it's relative, right? And people mostly think about warm and cool in terms of hue. But I think a lot of the time, it's actually chroma. It's chroma that makes the difference. So if I wanted to drop the chroma of my half tone, I did have, I think I had um, raw umber and white up to the right value. So I'm just doing this really quickly on the palette now. So if I wanted to, to drop the chroma on, the, you can mix obviously on the painting as well. So if I wanted to drop the chroma of that area, I can do the same thing. So this is like mostly raw umber and white. And I can paint that into the half tone and it will drop the chroma. Um, so although you say it's too warm, I think the main problem is chroma. So it's too high chroma. It's not that it's too orange. It's just that the chroma is too high. Do you know what I'm saying? And that's, that's, I think if, if anything, if I, if I had to say what I think the biggest problem with thinking about color in terms of warm and cool is, it's that very often it's not the hue. I probably dropped it a little bit too far there. It's not the hue, it's the chroma. So it was actually the chroma that was a little bit too high. I mean, that's, that's actually getting better now for the half tone. And that was dropping the chroma. So the hue actually didn't change at all. Or you think, oh, it's too, if it's too warm, I need to send it more yellow. No, it was too high chroma. Lost my shadow a little bit. The, the shadow color has gone a little bit translucent as well, so I've lost the depth there. So let's bring that back in, lost the value. What do you think, Suzanne? Good change? Dropping the chroma cools it, yes. Well, you <laughs> it's like you, you're determined to use that <laughs> warm and cool to describe it. Dropping the chroma drops the chroma. You know, I, I, I don't understand uh, the need to use any other um, way to describe it when that's already telling you everything you need to know. It, the chroma is too high. It's not that it's too warm or it's too or it's too cool. I hope it doesn't sound like I'm being pedantic. It's what it is is the chroma was too high, and that's why one of the reasons I think Monsel is so useful because it helps you to think in the right terms. So just thinking that that was too warm. You know, I could think, well, that means it's too orange or it's it's too yellow, you know, and I need to drop it. I need to drop the, I need to change the hue. You know, or maybe if I add some blue, it will, if I add a bit of blue, it will bring it down, right? <laughs> I know, I, I feel like I'm picking on you, Susan. I'm really not. It's just that it's like if when you start talking about things in those terms, you've kind of, you've lost the biggest advantage of looking at things in this way in that it tells you what you need to do to the color in order to make it more what you want it to be you know this is i always think like when i get to about this point with things i'm like ah oh, now it's now it's like fiddling time well that bit needs to go up in value that bit needs to go down in value if i could just get that a little bit closer so there's nothing wrong with any of the colors at the moment um the the form will come out more if I just manage to get all of the values in the right place. So kind of make sure that all of those colors are in the right place. I think the reflected light down here is the, the chroma is too high as well down there. Um, but that, I mean, it also illustrates the point about the bump actually not being a thing. The bump isn't a thing. And I don't see that that talked about so much, but you used to see about it talked about a lot on forums, like the bump, um, a higher chroma area in the half tone, and that was because the paint had gone a little bit um, transparent. It was actually bringing out 
too much chroma. I know you get it, Suzanne. You've been doing this stuff with me long enough. But, you know, uh, that is a, a point that I think is, is really worth making, that thing about the chroma. Being, you know, when people talk about warm and cool, a lot, that, a lot of the time they're talking about... Um, <laughs> I, I get it. <laughs> I do not go not so. That's not true. I just get slightly irritated. <laughs> and that's right. Yeah, go to raw, go to raw umber if you ever get stuck. The main thing that's bothering me about this now is my light. Light has gone a little bit too yellow. You know, I can also change that really carefully if I want to. So if I bring up some transparent red oxide and white. So this is like I'm doing it on the fly, but I'm doing the same stuff, right? I'm bringing transparent red oxide and white up to the same value. I've already got some paint on there. So if I paint this in there, it will send, without changing the value, it will send the hue a little bit more red. So there's a, there's a slight hue change there. You know, so that's getting closer now. You know, it's becoming egg, egg-like. Egg so we've got this very gradual change of value across here until we finally hit this area and then it drops off quite quickly. Let's see, bit by bit we're getting closer. This needs to be a bit more gentle. Gradation here. Oh, Studio Cat is wanting in. Oh, he's wanting out. I'm sorry, little fella. You're probably hungry, aren't you? This is always the point that when I, when I start to see like the thing appearing, this is when I start to enjoy myself, I suppose, really, is, is probably the best way to put it. It starts to become fun. And, um, you know, I mean, with a form like this, an egg, it's a bit like painting a sphere, only slightly more tricky. I mean, you can, you can literally, you can go on forever with it, really. As long as you don't make any major mistakes with the color you can just keep on working on it until you really nail it you know this is getting pretty close now i think i feel like i still want a smoother transition here let's try and pull that out oh look at that Big gob of the wrong value in the wrong place. I always think of those as like swear words, you know? It's like a swear word in painting. The wrong value in the wrong place destroys the form. And let's be, let's be softening all of this a little bit back here. So it disappears in. I'm, I'm, I've shown you everything I wanted to show you at this point. I'm, I'm basically fiddling, you know that, right? Yum. So Suzanne, although I was picking on you for, for using the term warm, <laughs> I just shuddered involuntarily when I said that, warm. <laughs> um, you were absolutely right. You know, it was, um, it was, the half tone was wrong. And as soon as the, the chroma dropped, the half tone, the form made more sense, didn't it? It started to work. And this is, it's a really good illustration of why I think chroma is so important. I want more of a highlight. Who wants more of a highlight? I want more of a highlight. I want my dinner actually, so I'm going to stop soon. But I want a little bit more of a highlight over here. But it's too, my highlight is too red, so I'm going to, a little bit of transparent, too yellow, sorry, so I'm going to make it more red. A more red highlight with just transparent red oxide and white. And I think it should be like here-ish. You know, but you, you could really, I mean, this kind of stuff can be very, very difficult if you don't have a good handle on color. If you do have a good handle on color, it just becomes 
frankly, it just becomes way easier. You know, obviously this is a quick demo. So if I spent a lot of time on this, I could really get it to the point where it was, um, really finally finished. But hopefully this has been enough to show you how that's, that, that stuff works in action. Oh, my, um, Diana says you lose your local color if you change the temperature. You do if you, if you change the hue for sure. Suzanne says, it sounds like it might be a useful idea to make a chart showing the value and chroma of each paint tube straight out of the tube to get familiar with the paint quality. It's a superb idea, Suzanne. It is absolutely a superb idea. If, you, if you're the kind of person that, that likes to do that kind of stuff, yeah, definitely for sure it's a brilliant idea doing that kind of thing. <laughs> Mariana, the chat is, is cracking me up as well. <laughs> oh dear excellent oh no you didn't no you had to go there <laughs> um, oh for anyone who wants to have a go at this egg would you like me to send you a picture of the photograph that I took because I can email it out to you if you would like there's some funny stuff going on here. You know why I think paints really beautiful eggs? Scott Connery is like my favorite egg painter. He's also a lovely man. Um, you know, it's then you, you fix one bit and then you see another bit and you're like, no, I've got to fix that too. And then before you know it, it's six hours later and you're like, oh, no, something's still wrong. Thus is painting. Carefully gradated forms are sent to triers for sure. You see it's looking a bit too shiny now. I need to soften this. I know little man, I'm gonna come and see you soon. Months leg alicious, <laughs> no. Wow, that's a good one. Um, Deborah says, how do you save the colors you mix? Freezer. I don't ever, Deborah, because I've never found a way to do it where the paint has the same handling qualities when I get it out again. Um, so I, I, I tend not to do that, to be honest. Oh, dear. I've never seen so many puns in one chat. <laughs> Pat, really good to see you. I'm glad you're here. I'll send the photo. Yeah. I'll, when I, tomorrow, I'll send out a link to this video on YouTube. Um, Scott is absolutely brilliant at eggs, yeah, Scott Connery. <laughs> yeah, definitely, leader, if you do it with a real egg, the same stuff applies. Basically, the same stuff applies, you know. Or just to show you, I mean, let's have a look, you see. I think my egg is actually, um, obviously, the lighting is different on this egg, but in terms of colour... I think my my paint is actually closer than the photo is. The photo is still a little bit red, you know. <laughs> What's for dinner? Well, Friday night in our house is homemade pizza night. Um, so I'm going to have a homemade pizza today, a vegetarian one. I think I'm going to have with olives and mushrooms. And it's going to absolute, be absolutely yum. And over here when we have, in our house, when we have... Scambled, scrambled eggs, we call them either scambled eggs or scammies. And my littlest boy, Jasper, is absolutely obsessed with them and it's his favourite breakfast. Listen, I'm done for today. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming along. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I'll send you a link tomorrow to um, the video on YouTube and I'll also send you a link to this photo if you want to grab it and have a go. Um, and I'll, if I remember and I get round to it, this is the bit I always forget. I'll also send you a, a better picture of the study. Thanks so much for coming along. You all have a brilliant weekend. I really appreciate you all um, 
<laughs> no yoke. Oh no, that's awful. I really appreciate you getting involved with this week. It's been it's been loads of fun seeing all of your posts popping up on Facebook and Instagram. We'll have to do it again soon. I really enjoyed it. Um, thanks very much. And I'll see you all again soon. I really must go and eat. Bye for now.